We had in the last 10 years, seven governments, six different prime ministers and six different majorities. So I think we have a problem. Welcome to G Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer, and today we are talking about Italy, one of Europe's hardest hit countries in the pandemic. They're now facing a third wave of coronavirus infections, heading back into lockdown at a critical time for their economy. How does Italy rebuild and rebound, and what does that mean for the European Union and for the United States? My guest today, Italy's former Prime Minister Enrico Letta. In a year filled with grim milestones, Italy has had more than their share. February 2020, the country's first known case of coronavirus, then its first death. Within weeks, the infection rate exploded. Italy became the first European nation to enter lockdown, and a cautionary tale for the rest of the world. This is the front line in Italy's battle against the coronavirus, a battle doctors say they're losing. A year later, the death toll there stands at more than 100,000, the second highest in Europe behind the United Kingdom. The number of infections, three million. In the badly devastated Lombardy region, a new memorial honors all those lost. It consists of three steel pillars, representing resilience, community, and starting over. It's a metaphor for the nation in general, at least in recent years. Italy's economy was already weak before the pandemic, but saw a nearly nine-point decline in GDP over the past 12 months, while unemployment was dropping from a decade high reached in 2014, it was still around 10% in early 2020. And if you don't like Italy's political leaders, just wait a second, they'll change. In fact, since 1989, the country has had 18 prime ministers. By comparison, Germany has had three chancellors, France, just five presidents. The latest Italian leader is Mario Draghi, Super Mario, they call him, a former president of the European Central Bank. His predecessor, Giuseppe Conte, resigned in January after being unable to maintain a governing coalition, even though it's actually quite popular. And Draghi was asked to build a new government. The environment couldn't be more challenging. A third wave of coronavirus is sweeping Europe and Italy is heading back into lockdown. Vaccine distribution has been slow, much slower than the United States or the United Kingdom, and temporarily halted over unproven concerns about the AstraZeneca shot. And there's much debate over how to spend desperately needed EU relief funds worth 200 billion alone for Italy's struggling economy. Draghi also faces a critical moment on the global stage. Italy holds the presidency of the G20 this year and hosts that global gathering in Rome this fall. It's also co-chair of a COP26, the UN Conference on Climate, historic year for that, and working feverishly to improve a lackluster record on green initiatives. There's a chance for a turnaround in Italia, but a lot of trouble on the road ahead. Today, I'm talking about all that with a man who has been in the hot seat himself. Italy's former prime minister, Enrico Letta, left office in 2014 to teach at Paris's Sciences Po University. But just days ago, he mounted a surprise return to Italian politics to lead the struggling center-left Democratic Party. Here's our conversation. Prime Minister Enrico Letta, you're having a nice life uh, at uh, Sciences Po, and now you are back in charge of the Democratic Party of Italy. What were you thinking? Uh, maybe I'll, I'm a little bit crazy, uh, but you know, uh, politics is a virus. I think there's no vaccine. So I, I decided to, uh, to go back and to uh, try to save my the party that I founded uh, 14, 15 years ago. There was a crisis, a big crisis, and uh, without a strong democratic party at the very center of the system, it would have been a, a very complicated uh, uh, journey. So I think it is good for Italy, it is good for my party. How, how much of this is related to the response to this greatest crisis of our lifetimes, the pandemic? 
because your country right now is slipping back into a, a third lockdown. Um, and I mean, obviously, we in the United States remember back in March the deaths that were coming out, the hospitals that were overwhelmed in northern Italy. How does it feel? How does it look? How are the citizens reacting to this continued, very urgent challenge of coronavirus right now in your country? Uh, it is not easy. It is very complicated. Uh, this fatigue is something that is very wide. Uh, I think now we are able to allow um, economy to, uh, to work even in a pandemic period, even in a lockdown period. That was not the case uh, one year ago when in three months, uh, March, April, May, everything was stopped. But of course, I think the key problem in terms of, so of uh, collective psychology is the, is the vaccine campaign. Uh, because if we are able to see uh, the, the possibility to have the, the end or to have a, a decrease and to have some hope, uh, to have uh, the, the, the vaccine campaign showing that it works, we are in a mixed feeling uh, situation, a sort of uh, turning point. Uh, I think April will be a month in which we will understand uh, uh, whether we, we can uh, decrease definitely in terms of uh, death or in terms of uh, negative figures. Uh, in that case, I, I think this fatigue also will, will decrease and we can look at the, the future with more optimism. But when it comes to the health response in the pandemic, of course, there's been nothing but negative headlines coming out of Europe recently uh, in terms of the slowness of procuring vaccines, of rolling them out, this debacle around the uh, suspension of AstraZeneca, while the United Kingdom, uh, despite having botched Brexit, uh, one of the countries that's rolling out vaccines faster than anywhere else in the world. Talk a little bit about how we should think about those things. It is exactly the consequence of a lack of Europe of health. You have to know that uh, uh, on social policies and on health policies, uh, Europe was without any common policy uh, for the treaties. In the treaties, you don't have the possibility to have social common policies or health common policies. And so uh, in March uh, 20, when we started facing the pandemic, I think the reaction of the people was, uh, why don't we have a European response? But the European Union was without any competence in that field. And even what you mentioned very correctly, and the fact that the UK is more performance than the European Union on vaccine, for instance, it is exactly the demonstration of the fact that we don't have, at the European uh, level, these competences uh, is a minus. So I think Brexit helped us. I have to say very clearly, because the, uh, the UK was the country putting vetoes uh, to more integrated European responses, and to have them uh, not on board today is uh, allowing us, all of us, uh, to, to go further and to have more integrated European policies in terms of health. We can build up today a Europe of health. It was impossible uh, years ago because the UK uh, vetoed these kind of uh, solutions. And it is clear that for citizens today, having Europe of health and having uh, communitarian policies for health is a plus, it is not a minus. I'll get to the US side in a second, but I wanna push you a little bit on this idea that the EU coming together on health is, is a positive for European integration. Just to be clear, the perception that the EU was dragging its feet, the regulations were challenging, um, that they were pushing too hard to get uh, reduced prices as opposed to, uh, which, which they got. I mean, they ended up negotiating better prices uh, for these vaccines, but it was a much longer negotiations process than the Americans, um, the United Kingdom, uh, who paid a higher price, but, but were three months ahead, ahead of the curve. Uh, you're saying that this is really because the EU didn't yet have any processes or competencies around this, not because we shouldn't be blaming von der Leyen uh, for, these, for these challenges at this point. 
I, I think she did a very good job uh, last year on the recovery plan because recovery plan is in the hands and because of the treaties are giving the European Union the competence on these topics. That is not the case on health, on vaccine, on other issues where the European countries decided to have an intergovernmental cooperation on these topics. But maybe it is not enough. So I don't want to say that everything uh, would be perfect in another treaty situation. I would like to say that um, we have to know that we don't have at the European level enough competences on that. And this is a big problem and that, that is creating part of the issues that you mentioned. So at least as much of a surprise as you coming back into politics, former prime minister, is also Mario Draghi, known as Super Mario, uh, now running your country's government. Uh, you know, for those around the world watching the show who don't necessarily know as much about him, t tell, tell us who Mario Draghi is in your view. Mario Draghi in Italy is considered uh, and not only in Italy, but in Italy, this perception is higher than uh, worldwide, is the one who saved the euro and saved the country and the European integration in the previous crisis. Mario Draghi is the one who said, whatever it takes, uh, we will save the euro. Within our mandate, the ECB is ready to do whatever it takes to preserve the euro. And believe me, it will be enough. And he said this statement uh, uh, July 26th, 2012 in London, when we were at the very uh, heart of the tremendous crisis, uh, previous crisis. And since he said, uh, whatever it takes, uh, the solution of the crisis started to happen. So Mario Draghi is considered someone who knows where it is possible to find solutions, someone who has credibility worldwide. I think it is very important also the fact that Italy will lead G20 this year. I attach great importance to G20. In my experience, G20 is one of the most interesting news, positive news uh, at world level in international relations. Uh, we didn't uh, succeed in reforming the UN and G20 is a sort of reform of the UN without reforming the UN. is a place where you can have the most important countries uh, around the world, uh, around the table, with the possibility to talk. I attended one uh, G20. Can tell you that is the only place where you can meet all the leaders at world uh, level. You can find a way to, to find solutions, to share analysis and solutions. Uh, so Italy is leading uh, G20 and Mario Draghi, leader of G20, I think is also a way for Italy to, to be at the center of the stage. Um, he has, because of his credibility, a large support in the country and in the parliament. That for Italy is something very positive because it allows him to avoid to spend time in the domestic problems of Italian politics. When I was prime minister, I was obliged to spend part of my time in trying to understand and to find solutions, to, to, to find the right uh, compass, uh, to find the right track and so on. For him is the possibility to avoid all this part in terms of domestic issues, domestic political issues. So I think uh, Draghi's credibility and what he did in the past, uh, will help him help him a lot. I think he has um, the protection of the president of the republic in Italy, and the protection of the public opinion, uh, because the public opinion uh, today is supporting him uh, very much. On, on the global stage, does he get to inherit Angela Merkel's position to a degree? I mean, Italy is not Germany. The economy is smaller. Your governments do not last very long. But Merkel is leaving, if you consider Emmanuel Macron a very strong figure, but also a polarizing one. I mean, Mario Draghi is the figure on the European stage that is, as you say, identified most closely with saving Europe. Um, how, how significant is that from an EU perspective over this next year or two? 
Uh, it is clear that at the European level, uh, he was uh, warmly welcomed uh, is the way to reinforce the European Council and a sort of pro-European integration mood, because Mario Draghi saving the euro, as he did, uh, is considered of one of the fathers of the European uh, integration. So I think it was a good news for Europe. It was welcomed as a good news for Europe. You mentioned Angela Merkel, you mentioned Germany. I think we uh, have to follow very closely uh, September German elections, because it is the first time in German history uh, that you have the chancellor not a candidate again. And so it is not clear and not easy to understand what will be the consequence of uh, not having the chancellor in the race. Uh, it is not easy to understand who will be the new leader of the country. So it is probable that Germany, for some months after September, will live in a, in a, in a not easy transition. I have to say also that in the same period, May next year, France will have uh, presidential elections. It will be a period of instability. So I think for Europe to have Mario Draghi there, I think it is a good news in this probable period uh, of instability that French, German and French elections will uh, uh, bring. Yeah. So finally, you know, when I, if I want to bring stereotypes into this, you think about Italian cars, you say, oh, they're always going to be in the shop. You think about Italian governments, they're always falling apart. You had 68 governance in 75 years. Why are Italian politics, what's the strangeness of, of governance in Italy? I think we have a problem. That, that's Houston, we have a problem. Uh, we had in the last 10 years, seven governments, six different prime ministers and six different uh, uh, majorities. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's too much. So I think we have a problem. Uh, the problem is related also of the instability of political parties and political forces. This is why when they asked me to come back and when, when they said to me, you are the only one, for me it was very complicated because there's something that is today very important and it is the fact that politics is in an evolution and this evolution uh, we have to, to fight, we have to try to uh, renew the way in which political parties are working, we have to apply uh, digital transformations to political parties. We have to uh, make internal democracy uh, evolving. Uh, we have to create a new way uh, to have democratic values and to have democracy in our uh, countries. And it is a fantastic challenge for someone like me uh, who loves politics, who taught politics, and now when they ask me, why don't you try to apply what you, uh, what you taught or what you thought? I have to say, and that for me, the most important push was six years that I spent with, the, with young people. I spent six years in Paris with a fantastic uh, young people worldwide, people coming from the rest of the world with a lot of Italians standing there. And for me, this generation, the generation in the 20s or 30s, it was a fantastic boost for, uh, for me to learn something, to be obliged to change. Now I think I'm a different person. And uh, this is why I'm a little bit crazy maybe in this uh, journey, but I'm happy because this journey will be very interesting for me and I hope very useful for the country. Prime Minister Enrico Letta, he's back. Whether or not you missed him, great to see you. Thank you, see you soon. That's our show this week. Come back next week and if you like what you see, and of course you do because we're connected. It's, it's simpatico, you know, it's, yes. Take a minute and sign up for G-Zero's most excellent morning newsletter. It's called Signal.